Rubel. Uh, I'm the San Mateo biologist for Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Um, and I work at Rancho Corral de Tierra, among the other San Mateo sites, um, which you've already talked about, Maury Point, uh, Sweeney Ridge, uh, Malagra Ridge, um, the Flager Estate, and, uh, and other properties. Um, so um, yeah, I, I mostly work on um, resource conservation issues in the parks um, and, uh, and I do uh, endangered species recovery, ecological restoration and invasive species control. Um, so if you're ready, I'll start my presentation. Take it away. Um, and feel free to put questions in the chat if you anything comes up and I can try and answer them while while I'm going. Uh, just bear with me here. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Looks great. All right. So, um, uh, this is a talk about Rancho Corral de Tierra, which is um, on the San Mateo coastline uh, between Montera and Pacifica. Um, Rancho Corral de Tierra is one of the largest areas of open space near San Francisco. Um, it's located on the site of the 1839 um, Francisco Guerrero y Palomares land grant. It was added to Golden Gate National Recreation Area in 2011. Um, and Rancho is unique um, in being located on a mountain next to the Pacific Ocean. Um, so there's a very steep elevational gradient from uh, near sea level to 1,800 feet at the top of Montera Mountain. Um, it's a great destination for hikers, bicyclists, equestrians, and nature lovers. Um, to put it in context regionally, um, I'll, can you see my pointer? Yes. yes. Yep, we're seeing it. Okay. Um, here's Rancho Corral de Tierra. Um, this is the San Francisco Peninsula, as you can see in this inset. Um, and Rancho is part of a, a very large network of open spaces um, on the northern portion of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, Rancho is located on the um, southwest slopes of Montera Mountain. Um, and there's four peaks on that mountain near the summit of Rancho. Peak Mountain, North Peak, Montera Knob, and South Peak. Uh, Rancho is about 4,000 acres large. Um, and it's part of an important wildlife and plant migration corridor um, in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, and as you may know, uh, this is a global biodiversity hotspot on the Central Coast. Um, and um, it's important for conservation because it's a, a highly varied and heterogeneous landscape with um, lots of spots for climate refugia and um, different microhabitats, um, which uh, support biodiversity in all its forms. So the, the history of Rancho is um, pretty interesting. Um, like the rest of the Bay Area, um, it, it's the ancestral home of the Ohlone people. Um, the, the band of Ohlone that um, uh, inhabited the Rancho area around Montera was the Chiguan Band. Um, and this land is on the unceded ancestral lands of the Ohlone people. Um, the Ohlone uh, 
practiced land stewardship, which included frequent burning to maintain open and grassy landscapes. Um, and there's still uh, a sign of their um, inhabitation of the area um, through the trail system, which goes over Montero Mountain. Um, the uh, trail, which, uh, which people used for trading um, between the coast side near Montera and up to Pacifica and points elsewhere um, was later used by um, different colonists who came into the area. Um, and it's still there now. Um, in 1769, the Portola expedition, which um, explored the coast for the Spanish um, colonization of California, uh, came through the Rancho area in 1769 and camped at the base of Montero Mountain. Um, and then um, this was followed soon by the Spanish colonial era beginning um, with the establishment of the mission of San Francisco. Um, and shortly thereafter, um, the uh, Ohlone peoples were relocated largely to that mission. Um, the records show that um, the, there wasn't a very large population of people in, the, um, in this area um, at European contact, um, perhaps about 50 people in a couple villages um, between um, Montera and Half Moon Bay. Um, during the colonial era, uh, the land grant system was set up um, and Rancho became a um, land grant for Francisco Guerrero y Palomares. Um, who coined the term Rancho Corral de Tierra, um, which means earthen corral. Um, and uh, he had a rancho um, in, at Rancho uh, and uh, grazed uh, large herds of cattle there. Um, the colonial era ended with the gold rush and the era of US um, the United States uh, possession of the land, um, which began in 1850 and went to the present. Um, and uh, this became a very um, important area for farming. Um, Italian waves of in immigrants, um, starting with Italians and later Japanese immigrants, um, pioneered farming artichokes in this area and um, later uh, cut flowers for um, market in San Francisco. Um, and we can still see the effects on the land from all this um, activity and ranching. Um, in the 70s, the conservation era um, began in earnest, um, uh, leading eventually to the acquisition of this land by the Peninsula Open Space Trust um, which purchased Rancho in 2001 um, and uh, Rancho Corral de Tierra was um, handed over to the National Park Service in 2011. Um, it's one of the newest acquisitions for Golden Gate National Recreation Area um, and we are um, still in um, the phase of planning and development um, a lot of the uh, entrances are, are not um, well developed and um, the, the trails are um, also uh, pretty much the trails that were there when we started. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to jump in. Uh, I, I do notice that like I don't uh, it would be good to hear from someone every once in a while, so I know I'm still connected. Um, so feel free to chime in. Uh, so uh, the geography of Rancho and Montero Mountain is um, really interesting too. 
Uh, it's a very steep mountain, um, you know, much akin to other coastal mountains like uh, Mount Tamalpais in Marin, um, which is uh, part of the coast range. Um, the difference with the Montero Mountain is um, it is a granite mountain. Um, it's part of the Selenian complex, um, which has slowly migrated 300 miles north along the west side of the San Andreas Fault. Um, and it, so it shares some uh, geology with Point Reyes, which also has granitics um, and is on the um, Pacific Plate. Uh, Rancho contains four major watersheds, um, which are Martini, Montera, San Vicente, and Deniston Creeks, which discharge into the waters of the Montera and Fitzgerald Marine Reserves. Um, and this map that we're looking at is a, uh, a kind of a heat map of slope steepness. So the redder areas are the steeper slopes. Um, and you can see that um, it's a pretty rugged landscape. Um, here's the four peaks, which are more or less contained within Rancho. This one here, um, North Peak is slightly outside of the park. Um, so you have tall mountains here, steep valleys, deep, deeply cut valleys with alluvial um, flatlands at the bottom. And on the lower slopes here in Montera, um, you have um, coastal terrace prairie and coastal terraces. Um, so uh, gonna talk about plant communities. Um, Looks like my fonts got kind of messed up. Um, so Rancho uh, has a diverse um, uh, assemblage of natural plant communities and um, anthropogenic plant communities. Um, so the steepness and topography that I was talking about um, and unique soils maritime influence all give rise to a, a complex mosaic of vegetation on the landscape. Um, so this is a picture of the um, San Mateo vegetation map. Um, so uh, anyone can have access to this map. It's pretty nice new vegetation map that's been developed for the county um, and each colored polygon on this map is a different type of vegetation. Um, so in the boundaries here of Rancho, um, you can see this uh, olive green color um, represents uh, coastal scrub, coyote brush scrub, which is the dominant um, uh, plant community on the mountain. Um, and down here in the coastal terrace, um, there's a lot more um, variety of different types of plant communities, such as grasslands and uh, wetlands, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so uh, the plant communities are, are pretty, um, pretty rich and varied here at Rancho. Um, but when you first look at it, you see a lot of coyote brush. Um, on, on closer look, um, you, you'll find uh, a real wealth of plant community diversity. Um, so yeah, back to plant communities. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about um, some special communities that are really worth pointing out that you can see at Rancho. And the first one is gonna be um, Maritime Chaparral and Rocky Barrens, which you'll find um, at the very top of the mountain. Um, and one cool thing about the Rocky Barrens is they um, host uh, 
large populations of Pacific stone crop, that's Sedum spasilifolium, um, which is a host plant for the endangered um, San Bruno elfin butterfly. Um, and uh, forgot to put the uh, Latin name of the butterfly here. It's a uh, Calatropsis mossiae baensis, I, I think. Um, so uh, this plant community is um, a favorite of mine. Um, you'll have um, very low growing um, herbaceous uh, plant community of sedums and um, native grasses and mosses. Um, on these um, cool, uh, cooler and more music north-facing slopes. Um, and this, this little butterfly only lives in this type of community. Um, there's a population on top of Montero Mountain. There's a population at San Bruno Mountain um, and um, a couple other places, uh, Malaga Ridge, um, but uh, the, this habitat is unique and special and doesn't occur in too many places. So this is a, a, a kind of a naturally rare animal um, which um, needs protection. Fortunately, um, all of the known uh, populations are on protected land and we just have to uh, try and figure out how to protect them from um, things that are, uh, you know, not development, things like climate change um, and invasive plants and disease and that sort of thing. Um, another uh, cool plant and community on Montero Mountain is uh, Maritime chaparral. Uh, maritime chaparral uh, occurs up and down the coast um, on, um, on special uh, types of soils, typically, um, and um, usually uh, is dominated by a species of manzanita or ceanothus. Um, and uh, these are often narrow endemics, such as the Montera manzanita, Arctostaphylus monterensis, um, which you can only find on Montera Mountain. Um, so this is a, a very um, cool and restricted uh, manzanita. It grows on shallow granitic soils, um, as you can see in this picture down at the bottom. And uh, th there's not um, there's not a lot of other plants that do grow amongst these manzanitas. Um, and the top of Montero Mountain uh, is uh, often in the summertime above the summer fog blanket, um, so it it can be hotter and drier. Um, it's a harsh environment. Um, sometimes the fog does blow very strongly and you get a lot of fog drip. But um, so these, these habitats are, are drier than the lower slopes where coastal scrub predominates um, in the summer. Um, but they also receive more winter precipitation um, from orographic effects, which is um, you know, how rain is, um, moist air is forced, forced upwards by um, rising elevation. Um, so like other coastal mountain islands, um, each one seems to have its own rare manzanita and um, the one on Montero Mountain is Monterensis. And then um, on the lower slopes and um, at the higher elevations, 
um, Rancho supports grasslands um, known as coastal prairies. Uh, <clears throat> coastal prairies uh, support a higher diversity of um, perennial grasses um, than more inland grasslands in California. Um, and uh, coastal prairies are also where many of the plant species in um, our areas are um, concentrated uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, so grasslands are really important for biodiversity um, and they harbor 40% of California's total plant species. If you're looking at the community, you know, grassland communities across the state. Um, the thinking is that only 10% of the historic extent of uh, coastal prairie grasslands remains. Um, it's a, a very um, desirable place to grow um, crops for agriculture and um, graze uh, cattle. It's also, um, you know, as we know, a very desirable place to live with coastal views. Um, and coastal prairies are often um, well developed on um, terraces, which are near the coast. Um, so uh, they're flat and easy to develop. And um, so under a lot of these kind of pressures in addition to invasive plants um, and off-road vehicle use. Uh, here you see some um, Dyschampsia cespitosa, uh, coastal tufted hair grass, uh, which um, is a, you know, relatively uncommon uh, type of grassland in San Mateo. Uh, at least um, in the in the northern part of the county, um, and we have small patches of that at Rancho, um, as well as uh, California oat grass and purple needlegrass grasslands. Um, so here's another slide that um, just talks about the value of coastal prairies. Um, so native perennial bunch grasses um, have. Uh, really deep roots that um, can descend deep into the soil. Um, they sequester lots of carbon, um, which is important nowadays. Uh, they nutrify the soils and support complex food chains. Um, and uh, annual grasslands uh, uh, don't um, provide those um, ecosystem services Although they are, um, you know, important for a variety of reasons, um, but um, the thinking is that um, uh, perennial grasslands have been replaced by non-native annuals from uh, that were imported from Europe in the 1800s, um, and non-native annual grasses are. Um, good at producing a lot of above ground biomass, which um, can crowd out native grasses and forbs. Um, so at Rancho, we're working on restoring coastal prairies and reducing the cover of non-native annual grasses, um, but it, it's challenging um, work. Rancho also um, is rich in wetlands, um, which support um, endangered um, herpetofauna, such as the California red-legged frog and San Francisco garter snake. Um, red-legged frogs uh, showed up at Rancho um, during the um, construction of the Tom Lantos Tunnel. Uh, and um, so we're, we're very glad to have them there. Um, and uh, 
we there's someone conducting monitoring for red-legged frogs in the Montera parcel. Um, San Francisco garter snake may or may not be um, present at Rancho. Uh, there's a population at Maury Point, Sharp Park, and one at the um, San Francisco airport, among other places. Um, and there are, uh, were sightings of San Francisco garter snake in the 90s uh, along Deniston Creek um, at Rancho, uh, but um, hasn't been seen there since. Um, so this year we're um, installing some wildlife cameras um, using special cameras that hopefully can um, catch uh, reptiles to, to see if uh, we still have San Francisco garter snakes in the park. Um, <clears throat> and aside from supporting wildlife, um, wetlands are important habitat for um, plant diversity. Uh, also flood control, wetlands absorb flood waters um, and slow them down. Um, so they don't flood neighborhoods um, and other infrastructure. Uh, wetlands are good for pollution control by filtering out um, nutrients and pollutants, um, and also really important for carbon se sequestration. Um, so we're glad to have the wetlands at Rancho, and uh, you should come on down and see them. They're great. And so finally, I'm gonna talk about coastal scrub a little bit. Um, I ran out of time with this slide to really do it justice. Um, I did my master's thesis on coastal scrub and I really love this plant community. Um, lots of people feel like it's uh, monolithic and not, um, not very biodiverse, but uh, I, um, I can attest that is not the case. Um, there's just many different associations of coastal scrub that um, grow on different slopes, aspects, soil types, um, and um, landscape positions. Um, and uh, there's so there's different species mixes that you find um, and they make a really beautiful pattern on the landscape as well as just um, at Rancho uh, creating vast areas that are relatively inaccessible for humans um, and it's a great place for birds and wildlife to thrive. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't have a slide about wildlife, but um, I will say that um, that Rancho has uh, what seems to be a pretty large population of mountain lions, at least a lot of mountain lions pass through the area. Um, and this year we're gonna be installing a gridded system of wildlife cameras um, to better inventory um, our wildlife populations um, and get a sense of occupancy. Um, and we're expecting to see a lot of mountain lions. Um, these are really important top predators that, um, uh, that help regulate ecosystems from the top down. So um, we're excited to have mountain lions in the park. I don't really want to come face to face with one ever, but um, I I'd like to look at one from a distance. I've actually never seen a mountain lion in the wild and I hope to someday. Um, on the left uh, is a picture of an interesting plant, which is um, the Montera Mountain tree lupin. It's, this is a variety of Lupinus arboreus, um, which is common up and down the coast. Um, 
and uh, it, it's sort of an open question whether it's a valid variety, but it is listed by CMPS as a um, rare plant needing more study. Um, and uh, it does grow um, on the slopes of Montera Mountain at higher elevations than you usually find tree lupin. Um, and it's got a different habitat than, than other tree lupins. Um, it's shaggier um, and occupies um, or colonizes um, openings in the scrub. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Hickman's Potentilla. Um, this is a, an extremely rare plant, um, which was discovered in um, at Rancho Corral de Tierra, um, or what was then owned by Post. Um, I don't think it actually, it, it wasn't owned even by Post at the time, it was private property. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it, it's a pretty interesting story about this little flower that um, uh, has um, made a big impact. Uh, so Hickman's Potentilla is a federally endangered herbaceous plant. Uh, it was first discovered in 1900 in Monterey by Alice Eastwood. And it was collected in Moss Beach in 1903 um, by Brandegee, and again in 1933 by Sutcliffe. And then it um, was never seen again in Moss Beach. Um, presumably, it was lost there due to um, agricultural or city development. Um, so it was presumed extirpated from there. Uh, the, the Monterey populations also have declined since 1900. Um, <clears throat> and um, during the surveys for the Devil Slide Bypass, which is an alternate route for Highway 1 over Montero Mountain, um, a large population of Hickman's Potentilla was found on the lower slopes of Montero Mountain um, in what's now Rancho Corral de Tierra. Um, uh, the, the bypass was to go over the mountain. It was very controversial. Um, the, you know, it would have destroyed a lot of beautiful habitat uh, and, um, you know, many people, including CMPS, um, were um, against uh, creating a, a highway overpass over Montero Mountain. Um, the alternative was um, what's there now, the Tom Lantos Tunnel. Uh, it was going to be much more expensive and take a longer time. And there was a faction of people who were also adamantly against that. Um, it ultimately came to a vote um, for, I, I, I think it was a county vote probably. I'm not sure about that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the citizens um, voted uh, for the tunnel alternative and thank goodness, um, because uh, we, we still have um, the slopes of Montero Mountain without a major highway crossing them. And, uh, and it also would have probably um, impacted um, the last, one of the last populations of this rare plant in a major way. Um, I'll just note I have uh, several pictures of Potentilla with insects on it and because we're doing a, a little um, investigation into what pollinates it. So you're going to see insects on most of these pictures. 
Um, so there are two known populations in the world of Potentilla hickmanii. Um, the Monterey population is down to less than 80 plants. Um, and the Montero population, um, typically um, the, the counts that we do um, show that there's more than 5,000 plants. 98% um, of the individuals in the world occur at Rancho Corral de Tierra. Um, so this species is um, nevertheless still very threatened um, by habitat loss, invasive plants, disturbance, and climate change. Um, we, we have several patches um, in the Montero parcel of this species. Um, it grows on um, shallow granitic soils um, with less competition from annual grasses. Um, uh, nevertheless, um, we're doing a lot of management to, um, to assist the recovery of this species. Uh, so we've noticed that the smaller satellite populations um, have tended to be in decline. Um, they might be getting crowded out by sh shrub encroachment, um, which is a result of um, a long period of fire suppression. Um, so we have done some selective scrub removal. Uh, it's also uh, seems to be really threatened by um, non-native annual grasses. Um, so we're experimenting with different techniques for um, reducing the competition. And we're also outplanting, um, we're, we're growing the plant and outplanting it and uh, developing propagation protocols um, that hopefully can be utilized in Monterey um, to help recover that population. Um, so that's, um, I'm close to the end of my slides for Rancho. Um, there's a lot more to see. Um, there's rare plants, there's uh, cool habitats. Um, there's also, um, I haven't really covered um, invasive plant problems that we have there, um, but yeah, that's basically my talk. I'm just, I have some slides that show pictures of the property so you can get an idea of what it's like there um, if you would like to visit. Um, so this is um, looking at the uh, farmer's daughter area of Rancho. Um, this is the view of the Spine Trail, which is a route you can take to the top of Montero Mountain. And this is an aerial view of El Granada and the Farmer's Daughter area. Um, in the foreground, you'll see uh, an equestrian center. So we do have several equestrian centers in the park. Um, here's a picture of the Montero parcel. Um, we are dealing with a pretty large invasion of uh, Monterey pines, which aren't native to the area, um, which you see in the foreground and in the background is Montero Mountain. And to the right are the coastal grasslands. Um, over here are the slopes that um, the Potentilla exists on and a beautiful sunset. So thanks for listening to this talk and I hope you, it's piqued your interest about Rancho. Um, and I'll send you off with some pictures of grassland restoration that we've been working on. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I can take some questions if there's any time. Plenty of time, yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Those are 
really fantastic photos. Are those most of those yours? Uh, yes. Beautiful. Good job on documenting. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> really gorgeous. Some real eye candy there. <laughs> Hey, um, there are a bunch of good questions in here, and uh, we're in no hurry if you're not. <laughs> we're yeah. Ho hopefully you got dinner before this. <laughs> yes, yes. But um, um, Yeah, I'd love to answer any questions. Okay, I can just relay them to you if you want. Um, I guess uh, uh, Bob, Bob is, Hall is asking about, he was there a couple of days ago and he saw something in the Carrot family, maybe Queen Anne's Lace or something like that, and uh, wonder if you know what it is, and is that being managed? There is a, so um, if you were on the Montero parcel, there are coastal prairie grasslands there that have been um, pretty impacted by, um, you know, a century or more of, well, two, yeah, many centuries, <laughs> several centuries of um, intensive use for um, grazing and equestrian use. Um, and so the, the grasslands, um, you know, there's native grass dominated areas and then there's non-native plant dominated areas. And uh, there's a lot of Queen's Anne's lace there it's not the biggest problem in terms of impacts to, in terms of crowding out other species, but there's a lot of it and it is um, pretty, pretty like uh, visible, I would say. Right, this year it seems particularly abundant. Yeah, we were weeding down at Maury Point yesterday, or um, we have a weekly crew that goes out and, uh, and we were impressed at how well the Queen Anne Slays is doing down there. Yes. Um, so many weeds have come up this year that I thought weren't there. And uh, it's been <laughs> an eye opener um, just because of all the rain. Oh. So um, Susan asks, are there redwoods in Rancho? And if yes, are any old growth? Uh, there are no redwoods at Rancho. There's a few coast live oaks, and um, uh, yeah, those are those are like the biggest trees there. Um, okay. It's very coastal. There's a lot of salt spray, and I think it just suppresses things that grow tall. Mm -hmm. So someone was asking. I guess this is probably would have been more contextual when you must have added some slides up, but. Um, they were asking the difference between maritime and the barrens. Uh, oh, so the maritime chaparral and barrens um, was meant to, to say that like you, you find maritime chaparral on kind of rocky barrens. Um, so the, the, there will either be chaparral on the barrens or there won't. So there's at the top of the mountain, it's kind of like a moonscape. Um, it, it's, there's barren rock there with not a lot of vegetation cover. Oh, okay. um, so and it's, the barrens describes that granitic uh, subsurface. Yeah. It's so rocky that not much grows there. Yes. Um, but, uh, Manzanitas can do it. Nice. Um, does uh, do you know about any Mission Blue butterfly uh, populations? Are they present? Um, there are none that we know of uh, at Rancho, um, but just over the hill in the um, Public Utilities Commission lands, um, there have been some uh, Mission Blues seen you know, on the um, eastern side of Montero Mountain. All right. Uh, Patty uh, is asking if the uh, park's borders are going to expand for additional uh, protection of habitat. Hmm. Any plans for that? Yes. Um, oh. Yes, I'm excited to report that um, 
uh, the park is going to acquire um, Scarper Ridge to the south um, and the Gregerson property. Okay. Um, but um, the, it's a long process that I don't really understand. <laughs> is that also a potential open space trust that's involved in that? Yes. Um, Post owns those properties right now, and they would like to transfer them to the Park Service. Go Post. Man, mm -hmm. they've, just, they've just been amazing. Yeah, they're great. Um, are there interesting, uh, Joshua asked, are there interesting ecological impacts of the nearby agricultural land as compared to residential industrial land use? Like weeds, maybe? Um, no, I wouldn't say so. I mean, there's, yeah, I think the residential areas, um, there's more weeds along the residential interfaces. Um, uh, and we don't, I don't, I can't think of major problems we've had from agriculture. Okay, yeah. So that's less tended to maybe in the, in the agricultural interest or managing their edges, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all the farms that border us are organic as far as I know, which is nice. Great. Um, Patty asks, uh, did the Chiguan uh, tend or burn the mountain? Do you know? Um, I, I don't know specifically about the Chiguan band, but um, I do know generally that um, the Ohlone um, conducted extensive burning and I, I wouldn't imagine it would be any different um, at Rancho. Um, so they, they burned um, scrub to um, maintain like good hunting grounds and also um, grasslands were a source of seeds for panole. Um, so uh, yeah, there was probably extensive burning there um, and uh, we're trying to mimic that in some places by just removing scrub. We, it's very difficult for us to obtain a permit to burn coastal scrub since we're an mm -hmm. urban, well, we have a lot of urban interface and um, so we do what we can. Um, yeah. Danny has got a really good question. How about do you accept volunteers or is it uh, strictly park personnel that's doing the management? That is a great question. And I meant to bring it up at the end, you know, I, I, Thank you for bringing that up. Um, please come volunteer. <laughs> it would be great. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're working on getting our volunteer programs going, um, which was just taking off before COVID. Um, and then that kind of knocked us back for a while. But um, we have a volunteer program um, every third Thursday at Rancho um, and you can sign up for that on the Parks Conservancy website mm -hmm. and I should have the link um, right at my fingertips but I don't so I'll maybe I'll try and find it while I'm talking. Oh you know what Christian uh, just posted a link yeah. for us. Thank you Christian. Thank you, Christian. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question from Ilana. Um, she asks, uh, what invasive plants are problematic to this area and what strategies are in place to manage them? Um, so there, there are a lot of invasive plants. Um, I personally um, feel like um, woody plants are the um, biggest threat to grasslands because they can, um, you know, type convert grasslands. And um, I'll just say that like grasslands are a 
focus of our work um, because they're sensitive to disturbance and invasions. Um, and they harbor a lot of the biodiversity and um, and also, you know, this endangered wildflower we're trying to save. So, uh, um, there's a, a, a really um, a big population of Monterey pine and cypress, which has um, expanded dramatically in this area and up and down the coast um, over the last 30 years. Um, if you look at um, time step photos on Google Earth, you can see that um, uh, a lot of Rancho was um, basically treeless um, in the early 20th century and um, has really um, been invaded by pines. So um, we uh, do remove pine trees um, where um, they're encroaching on grasslands and scrub, Great. and native scrub. That's music to our ears, by the way. <laughs> We're, uh, you know, I mean, we've lost so many grasslands here up in uh, San Francisco that Yes, we're, we're there on life support. And, um, but uh, yeah, I could talk about this for another hour. Um, there's other plants that we have a lot of um, Cape Ivy, which has filled up the drainages at Rancho. Um, and that can really um, take over wetlands and impact them. Um, and there was a large infestation of harding grass, which is a tall perennial grass. And I, I forgot uh, jubata grass, mm. uh, which uh, we have um, the most I've ever seen in one place no. uh, in Granada. So, mm. uh, wow. There's okay. lots. That's well, they, that, that uh, over at, uh, the Devil's Slide area. Oh my gosh, that was an epic battle over there, and they've they've done an amazing job of controlling it in that one area. Oh, good. I haven't been there. Yeah. In a long time. Yeah. Anyway, we're that we're it's very impressed because it's super steep, so somebody's getting up there. <laughs> yeah. Those you know steep slopes and working on it. Brave souls. Yeah. Um. Um, I think someone's asking about if red bud exists. Or I'm sure Toyon's there, so uh, they asked about that. But I, I think that would be a definitive yes if you've got uh, the good scrubland. So there's a lot of Toyon, no red bud. Yeah, and uh, this is my question: Do you get, are you in the birds? Do you got do you get thrashers there? Yes, we have California thrashers. Um, nice. Saw one earlier this year. Uh, cool. Yes. And thank you so much for this. I'll, I'll, I'd like to leave you with this last question because this is something where uh, many of us are curious about because we haven't really gotten been down there. Uh, I know Noreen and I haven't been down there recently to explore how to, you know, actually hike the trails there. Do you recommend starting hikes, uh, Bob asked, by parking off 2nd Street or what, you got any recommended trails? Yes, 2nd um, Street is a great place to walk from. Um, also, uh, the, um, I think it's Farallon. Um, it's, Hold on a second. Are there park maps maybe, if we go to the site? There are park maps. Um, LeConte is a good place to park. Um, it's on Google Maps. It's called LeConte Trail, Montera. Um, if, you, if you take that, um, you'll, you'll pass through uh, some trees and then you can get out in the grasslands and cross some wetlands. Cool. Well, we're really excited to uh, 
to go down there and explore it again. It's been, it's been too Great. long. Yeah. Yes, um, I wanted to ask you uh, if um, we could entice CM Pass to come down for a volunteer day. I, I noticed that you do those. Are, are they just in San Francisco? Oh, no. No, in <laughs> fact, we're really, you know, we're, we're constantly feeling guilty about not <laughs> supporting the, uh, San the Northern San Mateo. <laughs> it's sort of like orphaned between us and the Santa Clara Valley <laughs> chapter. And so, you know, we've been doing some work down in Pacifica. And uh, we'd be delighted to, you know, have a new outlet and, uh, and, and through some of our uh, San Mateo members. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'll follow up with you about that. Yeah, Great. I wrote down third, third Thursday. Every all right. third Thursday. That's probably because uh, we work with the San Francisco Natural Resource Division every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. and, oh, okay. Michael. And, you know, so we advertise those regularly. And after a while, we've gotten, you know, we usually get anywhere between six and 15 people showing up. So, um, you know, it, it's that's built up over the years. So hopefully, yeah. you know, we could get some enthusiasm down there for uh, helping you all out. That would be great. Yeah. Nice. So how many, what, what time are the, what are the hours you typically do on every on the, every third Thursday? Um, I think it gets from nine to 12. No, nope, um, reasonable and time for lunch. But we're flexible. Support. If we could get a large group, we can arrange for other days and times. We'll talk right. with our volunteer uh, coordinator about that. Mm -hmm. All we'll right. Back with you. Okay. Well, thanks so much. That was really, really fun. And uh, I'm, I'm tickled to know about all those uh, those little magics in there, like the potentilla mm -hmm. that are down there. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for the opportunity. It's been great to share. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll okay. see you out there on the mountain. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you next month, I hope.